Bowing Place. Today we're going to talk about Easter and the Four Tables. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. But did you know that historically the month of March and April are a time of spiritual and political betrayal, death, and resurrection? Think about it. The month of March marches us directly into April, or Easter, the month where Jesus was betrayed by Judas, and a time when Christians honor the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For Christians, the month of March, as it marches into April, is an extremely significant time period. For us, this time period, it's sad because it represents Jesus' death on the cross. And it's this sadness that we feel during Passion Week as we watch shows on TV or movies at the movie theater that depict Jesus' brutal torture and death on the cross that brings us closer to Jesus. Yes, recognizing that Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross for each one of us personally connects us to Jesus more during this time of the year than any other time of the year. In fact, every year at this time, prepared with tissues in hand, you watch the same TV programs or movies depicting Jesus going to the cross, knowing in advance that you're going to cry like you always do. And while on one level, a visible level, you watch Jesus from a distance from your seat in the movie theater along with a bunch of other people while you eat your popcorn, on an even deeper, more intense spiritual level, an invisible level, you watch Jesus up close, almost as if the hand of God somehow reaches out and pulls you out of your seat and into the movie screen so that you become one with Jesus and experience the sacrifice along with him. You know, it's this second and deeper level, this emotional level of love for God that connects you to God in a way that nothing else can. And it's this deeper, more intense level of love, this deeper, more intense connection that automatically makes you put your popcorn down and cry. Why do you experience a loss of appetite and automatically push your popcorn away from you? Because your emotional connection to God at that particular moment in time overrides your physical appetite. It makes you hunger for God more than anything else at that point. And you know, this is a crucial moment because it's the moment that you lean in mentally and spiritually. It's the moment that your ears, spiritual ears and physical ears, begin to listen intently to every word that Jesus is saying, which means that any phone ringing or any talking inside the movie theater at that time, it prompts you to respond to the distraction with a loud and angry, shh. Why? Because you're listening in a way that God intended for you to listen. You're listening with intensity. In Matthew 17, 5, God says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And you know, there's something amazing that happens when you shush the world and put your popcorn away from you. Because it means that at that moment, you care more about Jesus than anything else, including eating. You may not have realized it, but by pushing your popcorn away from you, you actually denied yourself the pleasure of eating it. But did you deny yourself the pleasure of it because somebody else told you to? Or did you deny yourself the pleasure of eating the popcorn because your mind, your heart, and soul were so profoundly touched by watching Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that you just lost your appetite? Yes, when you focus and you focus on your emotional connection to Jesus, it overrides your desire to even eat. It means that your flesh is responding to God on a much deeper, invisible, and spiritual level. And this level is above the fleshly level. And you know, this is what it's like to be in the true mindset of Matthew 16, 24, which says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
Now, there are many different ways to, don to deny your fleshly desires or pleasures in remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice at Easter time. For example, let's just say your favorite thing was chocolate, uh, yet knowing that at Easter you're, you're going to see Easter baskets filled with chocolate candy like crazy, but you decide that you're going to sacrifice. So you're going to deny yourself any kind of chocolate during that time. But there are two ways to experience this period of denial. Number one, you can deny your fleshly desires by focusing on the sacrifice that you made. In other words, you can spend the entire denial period focusing on the chocolate. Or you can deny your fleshly desire by focusing on the love that you have for Jesus because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. You see, the fleshly mindset places the focus of denial on your own sacrifice. Therefore, it causes you to pursue yourself, to pursue the chocolate. But the spiritual mindset places the focus of denial on Jesus' sacrifice, therefore causing you to pursue God. And you know, Jesus invites us to pursue him. He invites us to pursue him in Matthew 16, 24, which says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This scripture is a spiritual invitation to meet God in a specific place. The name of this place is called Sacrifice. However, there's only one way to get there, and that is to deny yourself. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Why does God invite us to meet him at a place of sacrifice? Because it is only in the place of sacrifice that you can exchange your own will for God's will. Sacrifice is the only place where you can exchange your own pleasures for God's pleasures. It's this exchange that allows you to enter into communion with God. While 1 Corinthians 11.26 says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. While it says that, Communion is much, much more than that little piece of bread and that tiny cup of grape juice or wine that your church gives you. Why? Because to commune means to focus on God, to converse with Him with extreme intensity, to communicate with Him intimately using all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, and all of your soul. And it's this type of focused love that can bring your understanding of communion to a much deeper, second, invisible, spiritual level. And as a result, this can bring you into a much closer relationship with God. You see, you can meet God in the fleshly, physical realm by taking the physical communion of bread and wine at home or church or anywhere for that matter. But there's only one place that you can take invisible spiritual communion with God. And that's to step inside the communion cup of his first and greatest commandment. In Matthew 22, 37 through 38, Jesus says that the commandment is, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. Why here? Why should we meet God here? Because it's the mutual place of love where both you and God can meet or commune together. 1 Peter 2.21 tells us that Jesus is our example. It says, after all, God chose you to suffer as you follow in the footsteps of Christ, who set an example by suffering for you. Therefore, we're to follow in Jesus' footsteps. And that means in all times and in all seasons. That being said, at this time and during this season, Jesus did not prepare himself to go to the cross to die for our sins by hard-boiling eggs, painting the eggs different colors, and then hiding the eggs. 
Actually, he did no such thing at any point in time during his ministry. And least of all, in the last moments prior to his death, you know, on the cross. Likewise, he didn't instruct us in the scriptures to paint and roll eggs during this time and season of the year in remembrance of his death on the cross either. Please make sure that you research the history of the God of Ishtar and rolling eggs for yourself. And you'll see that this tradition is not something that Jesus told us to do in remembrance of him. This tradition does not follow in Jesus' footsteps. However, Jesus did instruct us to do something specific at this time of the year in remembrance of him. He told us to do communion, which is mentioned in the scripture of 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 24, where Jesus said, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take our relationship with God to a deeper level by obeying Jesus' instructions to take communion in our homes and remembrance of him rather than decorating Easter eggs in our homes this year. But as we take bread and we raise our cups of wine in communion during this special time and season of the year, let's broaden our understanding of communion by experiencing both the physical and the spiritual levels that we just spoke about. Now Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. For example, as Christians enter into this time and this season of April, we automatically link it to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, before Jesus experienced death and resurrection, he first experienced betrayal. Now, since everything that pertains to Jesus pertains to the church, that means that since betrayal pertained to Jesus in this particular time and season, then whether we realize it or not, betrayal pertains to the church during this particular time and season as well. However, the only way we can gain a deeper revelation of the time and season of betrayal that we're stepping into is to look at the period of time of Jesus' betrayal. So let's go back in history to that period of time before his death, a time of betrayal. This would land us sitting right at the table of the Last Supper with Jesus, the place where he told us to take communion in remembrance of him. That's why this table is called the Holy Communion. You see, for everyone else, the supper that they ate at that table was only one out of many to come in the future. But for Jesus... That supper was his last supper, meaning the last meal that Jesus shared with his apostles in Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Do you see how the table of the Holy Communion and the table of betrayal are one and the same? Since Jesus is our example and we are followers of him, it's important for us to take a look at how he handled such betrayal. First of all, Jesus knew in advance that he was going to be betrayed. And not only that, he also knew exactly who would betray him, how he would be betrayed, and he knew the exact timing as to when he would be betrayed. John 13, 21 says, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Jesus knew the betrayal was coming. Therefore, he was prepared for the betrayal in advance. Yes, Jesus knew exactly what table he was about to sit down to, despite its beautiful tablecloth and decorations. Jesus knew in advance that a table had been prepared for him in the presence of his enemy. And in much the same eerie scenario, Jesus tells us the same in Psalm 23, 5, which says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Do you see how the table of the Holy Communion, the table of betrayal, and the table in Psalm 23, 5 are one in the same? These three tables are one in the same. And at this very unique table, not one of Jesus' disciples knew 
who would betray Jesus. So the scripture of John 13, 25 says, so that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus undoubtedly knew who his enemy was ahead of time before even his own enemy knew. In John 13, 26, Jesus responded, it is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. Can you imagine if you were the one Jesus gave the bread that he dipped into that bowl? Can you imagine not knowing that you were about to betray Jesus? Well, in much the same eerie scenario, Jesus warns us, Christians of today, that many of us are going to betray Jesus. Proof of his warning is in Matthew 24, 10, which states, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And in much the same eerie scenario as the disciples, we, the followers of Jesus Christ, are sitting around the metaphorical table, staring at each other in disbelief and wondering which ones of us it will be. So if you're saying to yourself, hey, there's no way that could be me. I'm strong in the Lord. I'm a leader. I'm a pastor. I would never turn my back on Jesus. The Bible says to you in Matthew 24 that if possible, even the elect will be deceived. Remember this, my friends. Judas was Judas until a certain spirit came into him, and then he was no longer Judas. Listen to John 13, 26 through 28 again. It says, Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. I'll say it again. Judas was Judas until Satan entered into him, and then he was no longer Judas. At what time will betrayal happen? The book of Matthew tells us that the time of apostasy will have wars, famines, and earthquakes. And Hebrews 3.12 responds with, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God during that time. Now, as we stated earlier in this teaching, the table of the Holy Communion, the table of betrayal, and the table in Psalm 23, 5, which says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies are one in the same. Can you start to see it? But there is yet another aspect to this table that you may not have been aware of. The symbolism of the bread. John 13, 26 through 27 says, Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Who does the Bible tell us is the bread? In John 6, 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus is the bread. Interestingly enough, this bread that Jesus dipped into the bowl is known in the Bible as the bread of affliction, which is symbolic of three things. The bread of affliction is symbolic of number one, Jesus, because he is the bread of life. Number two, betrayal, the betrayal that was about to come. And number three, suffering, the suffering that was about to come. These are the symbols of the bread of affliction. Where do we find the bread of affliction mentioned in the Bible? We find the bread of affliction at the Passover table. In Deuteronomy 16, 3, which says, when you eat this meal, what meal? What meal are they talking about? The Passover meal. When you eat this meal, do not eat bread prepared with, meast, with yeast. For seven days you are to eat bread prepared without yeast, as you did when you had to leave Egypt in such a hurry. Eat this bread. It will be called the bread of suffering, the bread of affliction, so that as long as you live, you will remember the day you came out of Egypt, that place of suffering. 
Do you see how the table of Holy Communion, the table of betrayal, the table in Psalm 23, 5, and now the table of Passover are one in the same? These four tables are one in the same. Can you see the fullness of the table yet? Do you see the time and season of betrayal and suffering yet? You know, Passover is always right around the time of Easter, by the way. The scripture says for seven days you are to eat bread prepared without yeast. This is why during this one specific week during the year, Christians should not eat leavened bread, meaning bread with yeast. Why? Because yeast is representative of sin. Galatians 5, 9 says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so, if you have been taught to remember and honor Jesus at this time of year by disregarding Passover completely and instead painting hard-boiled eggs, hiding hard-boiled eggs, and rolling hard-boiled eggs around in the grass, then this is like adding yeast to your bread at this time of year. Especially when Jesus told us that he is our example and that if we want to follow him, that suffering and sacrifice are part of this. And if you exempt yourself from suffering by saying, Jesus already suffered for me, then tell me, why do we as believers still suffer? Why are you suffering right now? 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Also, Isaiah thirty twenty says, although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Well, you say, I'm a Christian. I have nothing to do with the bread of affliction at the Passover table because that's for Jews. That's for Jewish people. But it's because you don't understand that the bread at the table of the Passover is the very same bread at the table of the Last Supper. Don't you understand that you as a Christian sit at the same table with the Jewish people? Why? Because we are all God's chosen people. Listen to what the Lord has to say to the Jewish people. Deuteronomy 7, 6, he says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And the Bible tells us that as Gentiles, we are grafted in and are one with the Jews. And because of this, we the Gentiles are part of God's chosen people. Listen to what the Lord has to say to all non-Jewish believers in Galatians 3:26 through 29. The scripture says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself, yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. Nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, because you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this means that you are of Abraham's seed. Therefore, you cannot say that suffering is only for Jerusalem, for God's chosen people. No, my friends, suffering belongs to all Christians as well. If we will not have any part in their suffering, then how can we have a part in their redemption? Therefore, Christians, during the time of Passover, should not be eating anything leavened. Once again, Ecclesiastes says that there is a time for everything. In other words, Christians should do everything that is in the Bible, but not everything we do is appropriate for the present time we're in. I'm going to say that again. Christians should do everything that is in the Bible, but not everything we do is appropriate for the present time we are in. 
1 Corinthians 10.23 says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. That's 1 Corinthians 10.23. In other words, yeah, as a Christian, you have the right to do anything as long as it is befitting to Jesus Christ. Now, Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says that there is a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. Symbolically, the months of March and April are the time periods prior to Jesus' death on the cross, a time which includes Passion Week or Holy Week, a one-week period of time prior to Jesus Christ's death on the cross, a time of remembrance, a time that Ecclesiastes 3, 4 states is a time to cry, a time to grieve. Well, no, you say, I prefer to celebrate his resurrection over his death. I prefer to be happy for the fact that I'm saved. I have something to be happy about. I'm saved. I'm happy. But you see, that's just it. You are saved. You are. But how many of your family members, how many of your friends, your co-workers, even your enemies, how many millions of people are not saved? Would you not grieve for the dying world around you? Jesus as the bread represents sacrifice, and not just a sacrifice for you, but a sacrifice for all. Did he not divinely intervene for you? And we too must follow in his footsteps by divinely intervening through fasting, through prayer and supplication for the unsaved world around us. This is a time to deny yourself for the sake of the lost world, not to gorge yourself in celebration of your own salvation. It's a time when we as Christians, instead of saying, come Lord Jesus, come, we should be saying, please Jesus, even if it means that we must suffer. Please tarry just a little bit more, just a moment more for the sake of the lost, for the sake of their salvation. Lord, if you could just wait one second longer so that just one more of my brothers and sisters could be saved. And yes, Lord, I am willing to do whatever it takes, even if that means I must suffer even if that means I must wait and suffer, even if that means, like you did, for someone else's sake. Matthew sixteen twenty four, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Therefore, Luke 12, 56 says the following to you, you fools, you know how to interpret the weather signs of the earth and sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. Jesus knew his purpose. Therefore, he was prepared for the betrayal in advance. Why did the Bible tell us these things in advance? So the church, like Jesus, would know their purpose and would be prepared for their betrayal in advance. Yes, just like Jesus, the church should know the table she is about to sit down to. Jesus knew in advance that, like Psalm 23, 5 says, a table had been prepared for him in the presence of his enemy, and so should the church know that just like Psalm 23, 5 says, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and he refreshes my soul. He guides me 
along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen.